the meeting of women met us here already in June, after years over, in 2023. And we want to talk about the interview conference, which I missed, but Christine didn't miss. And so I hope to get some good stories about it. But before, mm -hmm. as always, a little bit of check-in. And I would like to start with South Africa. Thank you, ladies. I'm Hanalee. I'm here in Cape Town, South Africa. And I just smile when you're sharing about the elections and all the stuff going on in Germany and Austria and also Italy. And another friend of mine also in the UK is trying to board land, a beautiful place in France, and he can't get a visa to go and live there. And he's just horrified. And he said, that's what people voted for for Brexit. So I said, welcome to the party because we've been used to that type of treatment forever as South Africans. Traveling is very difficult for us to get visas into certain countries. Um, so that was quite interesting when you also shared that frustration that we also used to. I'm good. I'm still simmering in. I did a sense shifting session yesterday for a friend and I'm just still basking in that energy so I'm I'm grateful to be here with your ladies and to share it in this way with you too and I'll pass on to Monia yeah in Vienna well as I said we have such interesting times it really is enough it's just horrible and a friend of ours is dying right now and he is and now we are ventilate they are ventilating what kind of assisted death he can because he has been suffering extremely for a year now. Can't even turn around in his bed. And, and still it's difficult to, uh, you have to have your sources and the doctor and uh, the pharmacy who provides the medication. So it's really, yeah, I hope to succeed. And of course the family is just, they are united behind him, but still it's just hard for them. So it's depressing and I hope you will cheer me up. And if you don't, it's all right as well. <laughs> it's just, I shouldn't depend on outside uh, because I'm now reading again, cutting through spiritual materialism in German. And I noticed that I have a different resonance in German than I had. I read it in 1973 in English and maybe I put the language as a barrier around me. So now I'm reading it in German and yeah. Um, a friend of mine went to Hungary and he said it was a total overload. There were so many workshops and so much. Uh, so he just, he's now digesting it and sorting it out. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing from you, Christine. I pass on to you. Well, good morning, uh, made it back. Tom managed to not have to struggle too much. Um, the hardest part, I think, were the long flights from Los Angeles all the way over to Europe uh, for him. But it went pretty well, so we were pleased. Um, I don't know. I have a notebook full of notes. I don't have it with me. I could run if you really want details, but um, we can get into it. I'm, I'm just checking in and letting you know the trip went pretty well, adjusting now again to the time change and uh, yeah, and not eating Hungarian food for a change. That's <laughs> that's something. Um, yeah, we had a good trip. It, it was a good trip. I'm really happy we went. And I will pass on to Victoria. Hello, everyone. Um, I just got off a, a brief text exchange with Beatrice, which is... Um, a rare occurrence indeed, but I knew today that she wanted to be here. So I checked in with her. Um, so she sends her love. She would like all of us um, to send all positive vibes and energy and um, spiritual <laughs> powers her way. She's in tech right now. She has one day of tech for um, this production of the play that she's uh, she's doing all this the scene design but she told me we talked on the phone yesterday briefly which is also and I only talked to her when she's under huge stress <laughs> um, but I'm glad I'm there for her um, apparently 
I mean, it's the, it's the US premiere of this play, play by Arthur Miller. I, I talked about it last, I don't know, was it with a German group maybe? Um, and so it's a really big deal uh, because of course he's a major, major playwright and um, it was never produced in his lifetime. And it's um, it, the, the, the setting, it's about the workers, um, the dock workers in New York. That's what the play is about. And the play is being staged on a barge um, where the dock workers still work today. So it's gonna be, Beatrice says it's a totally amazing experience because um, the barge is in the water and it's moving. And so you feel like you're actually in the action um, and it's a very, um, they have very limited tickets. So, so they only have two rows of seats for the public. And that means that, um, that you're just, she said it's, she, she's really excited about it. And yesterday the New York Times was there um, for their, to, to interview everybody involved in the production. I don't know yet if she, I, I told her, I said, I said, make sure you're very prominent. Like <laughs> every time the journalist turns around, you're standing there <laughs> ready to answer questions. Um, so we'll see. Anyway, it's really, really exciting. But she just wrote to me now. She said she sends her love and she misses all of you. Um, and she wishes she could be here today. But um, she said she has um, an 11 hour tech rehearsal today. And um, she said she has to cram in like five times that amount of work. And I mean, that would take like five times that time because um, the the whole thing is being done on a tiny, tiny budget, which is typical for the United States, for those of you in other countries who know that uh, Europe's a lot more generous with with sub art subsidies. Um, so Beatrice, she thought it would be a regular crew for the play, but it turns out it, it's the director and her and um, a couple of people are gonna like do lighting and stuff. <laughs> so. So it's pretty, it's a pretty daunting task. Um, so, um, and I have nothing particular to report. Um, hopefully I will in a few weeks, um, but I'll talk about that later. So, uh, and welcome back, Christine. Can't wait to hear about your, more about your trip. Um, so Hanali, did you already share? I'm, I'm all mixed up now. You did, yeah, that's what I thought. I, I heard everybody, but I was in transit. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so Heidi, over to you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the other Christine wanted to come today, but then there's something and she didn't come, not even today. So, but I, she said to say hello to you and she hasn't forgotten us. So, yeah, for me, what should I say? Uh, life goes on and it's, I'm very in many deep processes at the moment. I just came from a um, online Entladungsraum. Uh, from the Vivian Ditma, was she at the conference, Vivian Ditma? Last year she was, but I don't know if she was this year. And I'm taking, taking her course of the emotional backpack. And so it was just a, a, a session where for 10 minutes, you have somebody holding the space for you. And, and then you turn around. And you tell what is going on in you, what is appearing, feelings especially, and but maybe also thoughts, whatever is coming up, also physical. Um, and um, yeah, it's interesting. So, and I'm very much in, into writing and getting clear about things. And, uh, you know, it's also an interesting time in the interiority. The outside at the moment, I have decided not to go into it too much because by now I know so many things. I don't want to, to dig any deeper because I think deeper uh, it hardly can go of what I realized in the last three years, what is going on. So I decided to go and try to create something more let's say uplifting <laughs> and not to be too much torn down also by the ex uh, external uh, events in this these crazy times for me it's it's uh, often that i start to laugh because it's it seems to be a theater play on, on, in reality as, as if it had changed you know what is going on as Monia I told about the elections, which is the same thing in Germany, not even elections in our countries we are able to do. So 
I mean, <laughs> we were known for to be so effective and so so serious and so everything. It's all grumbling, you know. That's so, <laughs> I, I just can't only only laugh. <laughs> So the identity is, um, which we thought we had, I mean, personally, globally, socially, whatever, it's sort of fading away and we have to get our pieces together and create something new, in my opinion. So that's where I am. And I would really love you, I didn't uh, sign up this time. I didn't even uh, listen to the main talks, which we could have listened to on the on internet. I actually totally forgot that it was the, the conference, so I had other things in my head. But I would really like to know how, how it went, how the overall um, overall atmosphere was, and then what you took personally from it. Is it okay for you that we listen to? Yeah. Good. So, Christine, over to you. Yeah. Um, it is like a fire hose, you know, coming at you for five days. It's it's a lot. And the whole time certain, you know, people are coming and people are leaving, you know, it's um, you think you're going to see somebody and then you find out that they hopped a plane that day to, to leave. So I think there was over 400 people, but some of those were online. So I'm going to guess somewhere between 350 and 400 people in person. And again, it varied um, by the last day. Certainly a lot fewer people were there. Um, the good news was there was a lot of good presentations and workshops and just a lot of information. I can give you what I think were some of my highlights. But the bad news was <laughs> my workshop, only two people came. So despite having spent probably... I don't know, 80 to 100 hours reading books, making notes, creating slides. I had video, I had songs, I had poetry, I had everything. <laughs> and uh, two people came. Um, I thought what we did together, uh, the few of us went well. It was kind of, I continued to, with the process that I wanted for the heroine's journey. Um, so, what we did, the three of us, was very intimate and fine. Um, I think a couple of, it, it, I was sad though. After it was over, I was really sad. And I went back, just back up to my room to cry a little. I am not a crier. It takes a lot to get me to cry. Um, but it, it was just kind of sad. And I remained sad for the rest. That was on Saturday afternoon. And I kind of remained sad for the rest of the conference. And I realized it wasn't just my workshop. Um, and, and the disappointment in that, though I was disappointed, but it, it was just all the feelings that had been coming up for days, you know, just a flood of feelings, and uh, it ended up in some tears. Um, the workshops, there's 10 of them at a time. <laughs> so all these people have to pick from 10 workshops. And both keynote speakers that went in the morning also were doing workshops simultaneously. So I think when I give feedback to the uh, organizers, I really don't see why, you know, an unknown person like me is going up against an international speaker. <laughs> I happen to be going up against Gabor Mate, who's very well known, and um, Gail Horchaka. Gail Horchaka, you, you know who she is, I guess. Yeah, something right? like Heidi. that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah something like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they were the two keynote speakers. They had a workshop. And uh, then there were eight of us, eight other people. So there were 10 workshops at the same time. Um, Tom did a workshop the day before, and he had 10 people come to his. And of course, he was also disappointed with that, although 10 people is a lot better than two. <laughs> but he, he also was disappointed, you know, in the turnout. So um, the other thing that I think made a difference was they had us doing, uh, we were in like groups of three presenters or four presenters. And I was in the group called Women and Leadership. And we presented in the morning. The three of us had a 20 minute segment where we go over, you know, our topic. 
And then I ended, then we all did the workshop in the afternoon. I guess some of us did the workshop in the afternoon. And I kind of felt that maybe having just been open in the morning for people who wanted to hear about this and then actually have a two and a half hour workshop as follow-up, it, it just, it just didn't work. I, I think the organization was not real good. So anyway, uh, that was, that was my piece. Um, so Christine, let me interrupt you. Why don't we do a, a, a presentation either here or record it and, uh, uh, put it up or or did they uh, record your workshop no they didn't record the workshops so they were we the will do thing. that we will yeah. do that okay. so it's at least not yeah. not uh, completely <laughs> futile what you did 100 hours oh dear Mama yeah me. yeah well if you remember Heidi we proposed this for the 2020 conference yeah, yeah. so mm -hmm. I've also been you know working on it for years you know it's been uh, a little little pieces at a time but so, you learned something, and now you can teach others about it. That's good, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So we will make an appointment. We talk in, in another time about it. Okay. Yeah. Um, my favorite speakers were uh, Robert Keegan, who was just funny. He was so um, his presentation uh, got to the point about adult development. Um, and yet he used a lot of humor throughout his talk and, and he was just delightful to listen to. And I wanna go back and read some of his books and go on YouTube and see if he has stuff there. I'm sure he does. Uh, Vivian Dittmar had a keynote and she was very good. She talked kind of spontaneously. Um, and again, more from the heart in terms of uh, some of it was about women and ha women having more visibility. Um, Nomali Pereira talked about where is Integral gonna go? And then I followed up and went to her workshop where we talked and brainstormed some more about what's gonna happen when Ken Wilbur leaves us, who is going to, how and who, and in what manner will integ the Integral movement uh, continue? So uh, we looked at, um, centralized and decentralized hierarchies for organizations. Uh, Gabor Mate always depresses me. He depressed me again. <laughs> and I'm, I mean, I'm used to hearing sad stories all the time, but he's a psychiatrist uh, who worked, who lives in Canada. He was born in Hungary, li work, lives in Canada and has done his work there with addiction populations. And that has led him into talking about trauma but he mostly just talked about healthcare um, and how poor Western healthcare is about the mind body connection and all the stories about, he was encouraging that people could really heal themselves and go into remission. My problem with it was he didn't really indicate how anybody has done that, what were the methods, and I'm sure there's many, I'm sure there isn't just one method, I'm sure there's herbs and naturopaths and homeo homeopathy and all kinds of things. Um, but he didn't really talk about any ways to improve the systems, he just talked about how neglectful Western medicine is about the mind-body connection. Um, so his overall message is good, but I have a problem with some of the specifics of how he brings that across. Um, I listened to, uh, I don't know, uh, she lives in Munich. Her name's Marianne uh, Bozan, B-O-Z-E-S-A-N. Um, she talked about artificial intelligence and a wonderful presentation about how not to be afraid of AI because it's here and it's not gonna go anywhere. Um, and she said, actually, it was started to be developed in the 1970s. And it's just that it, it was not well known and it took all the computing power that we have now in the you know early uh, 21st century and, and more consistently in the last five years, there's all this computing power. And so AI is just taking off. And she talked about exponential curves and other examples of that, and, and AI is one. Um, and she she mostly was encouraging and say, get 
get used to it, get to know how to use it. It's not going to be you versus AI. That's not the competition here. The competition is between you and who uses AI better, who's more effective in using AI. Um, so that was good. Uh, that was a good presentation. Um, ben Say always does a good job. He also talked about integral overall and globe. They were talking about planetary awareness. Planetary awareness was the theme of the conference. So people then tried to um, talk about what stage of development, certainly second tier, has planetary awareness. Um, but at what stage does planetary awareness start to come on and how much of the globe has the capacity to recognize um, uh, the planet and the unity of it all. So um, that was the overall theme, you know, trying to understand where is the globe and how can we advance more planetary aware awareness with states and stages and types and that kind of thing. It was good. It was good. Um, we, uh, Ben Say always has things in the evening. He had movies. We had a big bonfire with Hungarian uh, folk rituals and folk songs. And we had an ecstatic dance where everybody kind of dances crazy. And we had a closing dinner where there was an open mic and I couldn't believe the talent. Well, I could believe the talent because this is an extremely uh, creative group of people um, who show up for things. They really show up when they, when they come. But it was amazing from musicians to poets, um, to people who, who could make sounds with their mouth but not sing. Um, it was extraordinary. Uh, it, it was a delightful uh, couple of hours of uh, watching people perform spontaneously. Um, and then we went on the Magical Mystery Tour for three days, a day in Budapest, seeing the sights, a day, um, where was the second day? Oh, we went to a Buddhist temple and they have a, like a 20 foot or 30 foot singing bowl. And we got to stand in the singing bowl and lay down in the singing bowl. It's so huge. They have like a, a, a post that hits the singing bowl to make it ring because it's so big. Um, and then we also had some other sound uh, sound sessions with gongs and, and singing bowls and chimes and stuff like that. And it was delightful just meditating and uh, spending time um, just qu being quiet and being still and using the, the sound therapy. Um, we went to a, a Hungarian village we went to a castle. Uh, we went to had a Renaissance lunch. We went to a beautiful park and sat in the stillness of a forest. Ben Say is very good at finding these little places in Hungary that are kind of off the beaten track and wonderful ways to experience both nature and the city and history. Um, the, pro the only problem with the Magical Mystery Tour is sometimes we spend too much time checking in places. This is a, a group of about 36 people. So having lunch and showing up for lunch is kind of a big ordeal. And it takes time. It took time, a lot of time on the bus and a lot of time around meals, um, which took away sometimes the things that we were supposed to do that day, the actual attractions. We didn't get to do them because all the other logistical things of eating and, and transport uh, kind of cut into our time and experience. But um, it, it was, uh, it, it's wonderful. And then the 36 of us during the course of three days, we get to know each other uh, a whole lot better and spend a lot more time talking with one another, uh, which is very nice. So if you're curious about anybody in particular that was at the conference, and you can, I think if you go to IEC 2023 um, website or IEC conference and then go to 2023, I think you can purchase what was the audio recordings. Um, and it's all the keynote speakers and it's a lot of the other presentations, just not the workshops that had the experiential stuff. So if you're interested.
Um, Cause even I, I mean, I, I was at the whole conference and you really only get to do besides the keynote speakers, you only get to do two things during the day. You don't, uh, don't get to do a whole lot, but yeah. was there anything in particular that you had a question about? No, first I wanted to say that when you talk about the magical mystery tour, we were there twice and I, I really liked it. But the same thing with the logistic thing and checking in in the hotel and this and that. And yeah, it takes a lot of time also because there are some people and I thought integral people would be different who just don't be in time. They just hang around and don't respect the others, you know, but Ben's it too when we were in South Africa. It's not uh, that he is accepted. So <laughs> no, what I would like you to talk about is what was the impact on you? What, 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 uh, how did you get it? You said it is too much, but how, how was, how was the atmosphere for you? What did you take away? Main thing. I mean, now you talked about the speakers. Yes, fine. But what was the, the main summary of experience which was important for you well i wrote a whole list of things to follow up on that you know people and talks and websites and a lot of stuff that i will continue to digest but i guess you know being there the the best experience is just the lovely people i mean you know everybody is just delightful to spend time with everybody's warm and open you hear their stories you hear how they get into integral and what they're doing with integral in their lives or in their careers um so i think my favorite part is just getting to know some of these people and realize how open and welcoming um people are um i went to uh i think i was struck most from my work in listening to um I, I don't know which workshops or which speakers but it made me think about how i want to show up with my clients a little bit more and challenging them in a slightly different way um to help them maybe get in touch with uh their own awareness of their self and their own sensitivities um, focus a little bit more on that. I've got a couple of patients who are really uh, have some major blocks, one about pain and one about sexuality and thinking maybe how can I use myself as a tool to help them go a little bit deeper with their own self-awareness. Um, so I had some ideas about that and, and I liked that a lot. Um, just, I think it's just very, as I said, by the time I gave my presentation and that was over, just all these feelings that uh, come up that are, um, even though it, it was related to tears, it didn't necessarily feel like, I didn't feel badly. I, I just felt very uh, moved, I guess would be the other word, just very moved about things um, and grateful for all the people who showed up and participated. Um, I think that's the main thing. Uh, I would like to say I will be more consistent with a meditative practice because whenever I do it on a more consistent basis, I like it and then somehow it falls away. Um, but maybe trying to do things with a little bit more contemplative prayer or meditation uh, and or both. <laughs> um, I always am drawn to some of the spiritual uh, aspects of the conference. And again, the, that was there. Um, they didn't have a lot of spiritual people this time. Like there was no Roger Walsh talking about Buddhism and there were no uh, clergy people at all there this time. So not a lot of direct spirituality, but of course, I guess I was struck mostly by how people's messages related to um, unity and non-dual and, and coming from that standpoint with integral. So I don't know, a lot to take away really. Well, I'm still thinking or rumbling or whatever about that your workshop was attended by two women only 
and a friend of mine who attended uh, Ukic, Uci, Uciks, Uciks, uh, workshop on integral relationships. Oh, Martin Usik? Yeah. Yeah, Usik. Usik. Mm -hmm. There were, I think, 50 people there. Mm -hmm. So it's obviously more the tendency is towards relationship. Although they did these usual things like uh, speed dating, there's two circles and you then after the, uh, two minutes, you just move on. So you get to know everybody in the room. Uh, yeah. But I'm still amazed about that, that people are more interested in relationships than their inner work. Yeah, but this is the new uh, ideas are that the real in, inner work can be only in relationship. So that the relationship is the most important thing to for well, maybe maybe the next workshop you give should be about the hero and the hero's journey together or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah. Well, if somebody's not in a relationship though, then would that imply they can't grow? Of course not, right? <laughs> right. So yeah, like me, I'm not in relationship at the moment, so I can't go. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and, uh, you know, Martin is pretty well known. I mean, he, again, a lot of the people, I, I don't know, out of the 10 people, I'd say probably half of them at least are kind of known names in the integral community. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Well, he wrote the book and I remember when he first attended and found out that there was no uh, integral relationship uh uh, what is it? Um, Look, at it. all present present in the in the integral forum so he said okay i do that and he from that moment on because um yeah uh no it's too it's too long back but i i i remember the moment when he sort of ah that's something i could do so um yeah and he was very thorough yeah, he was. I got to know him in the in the calling in the one course with Chris, uh, Catherine Woodward Thomas. That was two thousand ten or eleven, and we met there the first time. And there he he started to go into this relationship work. And then um, uh, that was when I did this course. Afterwards, I found Mark when I had finished this course. Two months wow. later, Mark appeared. <laughs> It was a coaching, uh, coaching training, you know, and there I met uh, Martin and then I observed how he went on and he did a lot for it. He really worked hard to, to come into visibility, you know, that also you need to have certain consistency and certain very clear ideas where you want to go. And he obviously had it and he's present now everywhere, no? And his two books. I have them both here somewhere, but actually I haven't read them. Maybe a little bit, but not the whole thing. It's too too big. <laughs> I just bought it at this one uh, conference or workshop he did in Vienna, and then I pass it on right away. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm reluctant to, 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 to read so, these big books. And with Charles Eisenstein, because it's an audio book, I listen to it, and then I can... Uh, read read by the ears i can read uh, longer books but it's too tiresome for me now with it. often there are little the, the little um ty types how do you say little form mm -hmm. no? so it, it's it's tiresome also for the eyes and i don't want to wear glasses to read so you know but listening is is good you can take it wherever you go and so i went to for instance to work in the vegetable garden and listen to it and that's fine I, so, I forgot to say one of the highlights for me of the conference was meeting Gertrude. That was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and seeing her in person. Um, so that, that was really good. In fact, her workshop was at the same time mine was. <laughs> her workshop that she was doing with two other people. And I forget that. I think it had something to do with We Space, but I'm not sure. We you know, sure. with the work she's doing. Yeah. But that was really fun. It was it was really fun to see her in person and get to know her a little bit better. We both found we found out we both have um, ad adopted daughters, 
So we found a little bit more out about each other's uh, family life. So, and she is, I don't know, she's going to like four or five different cities over the next month of June. So that's why she's not here till July because she's traveling everywhere around Europe <laughs> to see people. So, yeah, but that was great. Christine, I'm, I just want to say to you, don't be disappointed. I've been through what you've been through many, many times. And, you know, I just realized many years later that we were growing seeds, you know, because it's a new topic, for example, perhaps as well. People are associating the hero's journey with a hero, not the heroine, the feminine, more the masculine way and not mm -hmm. the feminine way. But don't give up. It's, it's such an incredible um, theme, not even just a topic. And the, the body of wisdom below it is so vast. So I just want to encourage you not to give up and to be, I know how distraught one can be when those things happen. Mm -hmm. But in my experience as well, I found myself numbers doesn't count because I'd rather work with smaller groups of people and it really has impact because I can really participate, I can really contribute, and you can really work the topic deeper, on a deeper level, when there's less people. When there's a whole room full of people, it, it's, it's quite on the, you know, on the surface then. So don't be so disheartened. I, I understand it completely, but I want, just want to, to um, I had to say that to you because I've been through that myself many times and I've realized Depth counts more than the, you know, the amount. So the deeper one can go with a smaller group. It's a lot more potent than speaking about a topic or sharing about a topic with 100 people, for example. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for saying that. Yeah, it, it did feel, as I said, it felt very intimate with the with the two women that were there and we all got to talk a lot i got to be informal about it i didn't have to you know feel like i was really doing a presentation it was more going over the slides and then us talking uh each uh along the way each of us being able to speak up so but thank you for that yeah i mean it it's part of it was the annoyance that the anger or the annoyance part was, oh my gosh, I put in all this time <laughs> and feeling like maybe the organizers hadn't thought about what it was going to be like. Um, and then the other one is kind of, you know, a sense of rejection or like, you know, nobody wanted to come to my workshop, you know, a little bit of uh, embarrassment with that. But, um, and again, that that's fleeting because Martin Usyk and Gabor Mate and, and Gail and all these people who are well known uh, were giving workshops at the same time. So it's not as if, um, you know, it, it's kind of understandable. I'm sure I did the same thing when I chose workshops. I tended to go to the keynote speakers and I wanted to find out more of what they had to say. It would pique your interest and then you would want to go to their workshop. So even I was doing the same thing for the most part, but thank you. Yeah. I can also share an experience I did uh, in, the, I think the first conference or was it the second? I don't remember. I did the morning practice with toning, no, with singing and you get up uh, tired at seven o'clock, you, you are there and then nobody comes, you know, that's, that's really disappointing. <laughs> once two people came and once nobody. So after that, I decided not to offer early, early morning things anymore because people are tired when they go to bed late and they don't want to, to get up again at seven o'clock and do some, even if it's sort of meditation, they don't, you know, some will, but maybe not in yours. They're also there, there were three, four different things at the same time at seven o'clock in the morning, you know, yes. so. Mm -hmm. uh, Christine, could you put the name uh, Mate in the chat? Uh, uh, I don't know because I don't know him. Martin's name? Uh, Gabor Mate. No? Oh, Gabor Mate. Mm -hmm. Oh, you find a lot on uh, everywhere uh, about him. He is Mate was an Yeah. Yeah. I think Gabor. there's um there's an accent over the A in Gabor and an accent I think over the E. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Yeah. And okay. what is yeah, your overall impression of Hungary? Is it wow. changed in the last years? Is it different or is it? Uh... The only thing I noticed different is that they're starting to get bigger cars instead of just compact and subcompact cars, really small cars. They're now starting to get standard size cars and even some small SUVs. Um, no, I didn't notice a lot of change in the country. The hotel is just kind of strange, um, very inconsistent. The From room to room, how well they've taken care of things is very inconsistent. Um, a lot of the hotel staff seem like they make you feel like you're bothering them. Like they're just not welcoming. They're just not warm. They're just not welcoming, um, which is weird for a hospitality <laughs> hospitality business. Um, you know what I want to say? I think it might be a, a relict uh, of the Eastern times because in, in Eastern times when, when there was still, uh, you know, East Germany and uh, Hungary belonged to the to the East. Uh, that was like it was in you were bothering them you know maybe yeah. there's still some of this tradition like and you're standing there waiting for somebody and they'll just continue doing what they're doing and when they're ready they'll come and you know yes and they won't say what can I get you or any of those normal things um but, uh, and a couple of times I didn't want to speak up or even say anything because I felt like, oh, I'm just going to sound like a spoiled American, you know, who's used to privileged things. And so, you know, I'm like keeping my mouth closed. But then I heard other people talking and other Europeans talking and, you know, you'd go up and um, we did a, a goulash party and they were running out of goulash, but they had a little bit left and, and you kind of put the bread in the bowl and then put the goulash on top of it. And I went, asked the server, you know, may I have another piece of bread? Because I saw a whole loaf of bread sitting there off to the side. And he just says, no, <laughs> no, um, just ask for things. And they'll just say, no, no, you can't have that. <laughs> it's like, it's it's just odd. It's a strange experience. Um, Budapest is much, uh, much more diverse. And I thought, you know, that there's a whole range of people there. And I think they seem to be happier in the in the city and certainly more accommodating than they were maybe in the outlying places where, you know, they're not used to having maybe as many people come or I don't know. Uh, but by the way, I was just looking at the photograph of Gabo Mate. No wonder you get depressed looking at that photo. <laughs> he looks sad. <laughs> <laughs> he looks yeah. very sad. Yeah, yeah. I've he, seen he, him many, many he, times, and I've exudes freshness. <laughs> yeah. What's your impression, Victoria? Victoria? Yeah. Oh no, I was just gonna say I've I've actually done a number of um, Zoom workshops with him, so I've I've had exchanges with him, and and um, you know, in in where he does like sort of like little model model interactions, and we can be guinea pigs for his technique and um it's it's amazing he's i've never yet i've seen him many 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 times i've never yet seen him crack a smile not once and um he's he's just very but but the really telling thing is there was an intimate actually it might be in the film i just put the link for the wisdom of trauma which is a um it's the sand people heidi that i think right that made the film yeah they're they're his big promoters um the science and non-duality people that's how heidi and i met in the first place um but the really telling thing uh, apropos of relationships is when i i think it's in that film or it's in something else um his wife who's a, apparently a very very erudite woman as well in her own right and she's a scholar and she's a i think she's a therapist as well um, of course, she's in the shadows because she's a woman, but um, she has the, she's uh, threatened to leave him countless times because <laughs> he's really, really hard to live with. I mean, the one redeeming thing about him is he actually admitted that he's hard to live with and because he's so depressed all the time and um, his kids don't get along. I mean, no one gets along with them that knows him well, basically. Um, and then when he's in the therapeutic role, 
um, people are just so terrified of him that they, you know, the, <laughs> I mean, because now he's now he's into psychedelic therapy, and and so the people just act like guinea, guinea pigs. They just lie down on the couch, and he could poison them for all it matters. You know, it's like he could give them cyanide, and they would meekly take it because because he's very. I mean, even when I interacted with him on Zoom, he was he was, yeah, like weirdly scary, almost like a kind of Dracula figure. So. He's brilliant though. And, and, <laughs> and he's done, um, it's interesting, actually, uh, he's done really amazing work with street people. That's mm -hmm. how he, that's how he started his work when he went to Canada. Um, and Addiction. he's made Addiction. Addiction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So people on the street with, with major addictions and also, um, people like street people who have been major trauma victims too, like incest and rape and all kinds of stuff. So he has a, I guess he's very, very soulful. And, and I mean, I guess he really connects with people and, and because he's so sort of dark and he has no sense of humor, it might reassure, I mean, this is what I thought it might reassure the people who are really, really traumatized and they, they themselves can't see anything in a bright way. Like they're not ready yet because he's sort of down there with them in the darkness in a way, but he has the wisdom of trauma. So um, he says that it all relates to his own trauma as a child, because he was um, not only Hungarian, you know, and it was, a, it was the Nazi period, but he was, his family's Jewish. So it was a big deal to, um, to get out. He tells the story that I think it's all in the film, the, I mean, his early life, and he explains why he's so. He was born in 44. So he can't really have experienced much of this at that I think, time. Yeah, but yeah. I think I think he was abandoned as a baby. I don't know. There's something about his his like first year and a half or so mm -hmm. of life. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. yeah. He anyway. It's the film's worth seeing because I think it's very. Um, well, I guess it's uh, one of these uh, things that when you say people become a therapist because they need it. Mm -hmm. So he yes. cures himself by helping others, I guess. Mm -hmm. But right. I, I was just, I didn't know him. And then I looked at him, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I felt sorry for him. It's just yeah. uh, no, so no, serious, he, so, so terribly serious. Yeah. I think he's clearly someone, well, also because he lives in that world, you know, just, I think just, um, just to work with that demographic for so many years, people who are, severely addicted to substances and have had very traumatic histories and just to no matter how many barriers I asked my therapist actually about the other day I said how do you how do you um manage I mean it's yeah, such a, that's that's what I that's what I was thinking yeah he but she he, my, he, my, he my, has the burden of the whole world on his shoulders yeah it's not necessary well, I think because he himself experienced abuse, like like the therapist that I'm I've been seeing for the last couple of years, is like the sunniest, sweetest. Her name is Wendy, and she's like she's like Wendy and Peter Pan. In fact, she was named after Wendy and Peter Pan. She's this this really she's really funny. She has a great sense of humor. She's totally balanced. And she said to me, I said, "Well, how do you you know you you have to take in all day long every single day these tremendous burdens?" And then she does hospital duty where she's with you know, suicide attempts and stuff. And she said, I just have a very, I mean, Christine obviously can speak to this. She said, I have a boundary and it's absolutely set. And when I leave the clinic, that's it until the next day. And she said, that's how I survived. She said, otherwise I could never have gone into this field. And, um, and I think with people like Mate, and there's a lot of people out there like him, they, they themselves have experienced so much trauma that, that, yeah, they've gone into the field to work out their own traumas, but they're never totally free, I don't think. But what do you think, Christine? I mean, you're a professional. I'm, I'm just a patient. I'm, I'm another one of the traumatized people. <laughs> well, I, I, I can't speak to psychiatry, but um, in psychology, we have to have our own therapy as part of our training. So you're starting to work out your own issues and can distinguish your stuff versus a client's stuff. And, you know, most people have therapy or consultation so that you can keep those boundaries. Um, so I didn't have trauma in my uh, early life. So I'm not carrying that around with me. 
but we all in our training that's supposed to be a part of or a big part of uh, what, you, what you try to uh, distinguish for yourself and continue throughout your career yeah i'm sure he's still working on it Anneli, what is your experience? You try to bring joy to everybody. So. <laughs> you know, when I also, with the first time I saw his picture, I was somewhere on social media, I was also just horrified. And yeah, I think I, I think there's a clear distinction. I had a friend from Austria who also he was working with the dark. I would I don't want to say dark stuff. No, it's it's, a, it's not a good way of talking about it. But with traumatic stuff. And the one day I asked, I was in Spain and he came to visit me there and I asked him, how do you cope with just working with that part of life? Because it's, it must be very depressing for you as an individual. And he took offense because I even suggested just asking that because I said, I couldn't imagine. I think there are people who are destined for that. And then there are people like me, I'm not destined for that. It's not part of my of why I'm here, I'm, I'm here to remind people of, of the other side, so to speak. And, but yes, um, I, I took, from my personal perspective, I had a lot of trauma in my life. And if I think back, every trauma was an um, opportunity to be creative, actually. So it took me, so gladly I was able, fortunate enough to work with that creative energy that's trapped when you're in trauma. Because from my experience, when you are in tra traumatic experiences, that your, your creative energy is trapped. That's why people go into depression a lot too as well. There's a lot of research being done on it. And when, once you get the understanding that that creative energy is so powerful, that's when you break the boundaries with the trauma and, and the stories dissipate, the energy dissipates. So I have a very different view just because I myself have gone through a lot of trauma in my life, especially when I was young. And it, it did help me to, to make that switch for myself. So hence mean, I don't want to go there. <laughs> I want to play on the other side. I want to remind people that they are away. And, and even some of the sense shifting experiences that I'm sharing, it's fascinating just to be present to see that what happens when we don't go into that? And we we get we were able to send shift into another state of being with all our senses and our being and how everything starts to click in. So I do believe also where we are. It's not to say that all the work that people like him has done through the years is not necessary. Of course it's necessary, but it's as if we are, my understanding of currently is where we are with consciousness in the world right now, our level of our consciousness expanded. We don't need to go for all that trauma anymore to work through those things on such deep levels. We can, there is a way, to, Barbara Marx Hubbard spoke about this as well. You can um, see shift into another state of being, still recognizing those things so you don't neglect them and say they didn't happen. It's not like it's not spiritual amputation at all, but it's the ability to feel and sense a different reality, and then, then it's much easier then to go and work with those with those things. For example, I don't know if that makes sense. It's just my personal experience, so it's all I can really share about it, and I can't speak on behalf of other people. But yeah, I think that people have very interesting life journeys, and they're all valid. They're all valid. So it's not that one is bad, the other is one is good. And I just also feel very, very, I, when I saw him the first time, his picture, I was really also just had a lot of empathy for him because I can't imagine a life where one has to be so sad all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody know who Andrew Cohen is? So there was a little, he had been accepted as a presenter. And then when his name was added, people objected to him coming. And so that was processed a little bit. And they decided if people were, some presenters didn't want to come if he was going to be there. Um, so he was uninvited. Mm -hmm. 
but Hans uh, Plescu from Belgium is an author and he wrote a book called um, When Shadow Meets the Bodhisattva, something like that. Mm -hmm. And he he brought the book. I, I got a copy of it. He brought his book. He wrote it. It's Andrew Cohen's story about working on his shadow and all the things that he did. Uh, and it's his account because I guess he has not told his version of his story. And according to Hans, he's worked out a lot of the um, trauma that he put on people. I think it was students, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. But, uh, but he actually, he, wa he wasn't one of the worst ones. There are much worse. Uh, there was no sexual abuse or anything like right. that. It's just financial and, of course, telling people what to do and leaving somebody because she is the, uh, uh, from Denmark and those are so revolutionary, uh, things like that. I read uh, the book uh, 11 Days at the Edge. Very interesting. And the method is the same. Uh, you put people under so much stress, particularly those that are already evolved. And uh, so they are brainwashed. Everybody is brainwashed. And uh, yeah, we had a, at the Integrale Forum, we had a tooth, what a guru should be. No guru should be a guru. <laughs> Who needs a guru? You can be your own guru and so on and so on. And uh, just reading now uh, Trungpa, uh, what he says about gurus uh, is excellent in German. I, I never noticed it that much in English. But uh, of course, uh, knowing how Trungpa ended, uh, he was just uh, also devoured by his own shadows and he couldn't cope with the Western civilization somehow. So it was really sad because he was a brilliant teacher and well, and maybe Cohen was also a good teacher. Yeah, I tried one, we tried one of his, uh, his uh, Women are particularly uh, prone to changing levels, transcendental levels. And we did this communal uh, sharing around. And one of his pupils was there and he was amazed that we could do it as well as he did. Because just by being what we were and uh, uh, communicating that way, until somebody, of course, a man interrupted the flow and then it was gone. And it's a, it's a common known fact that you have to be very, very unconcerned about yourself and just in the flow of what's happening. But his methods were, his techniques were excellent. So uh, that's the trouble because Trungpa also had excellent uh, visions and still what he passed on to his successor is just terrible. So uh, I wanted to, to talk to Cohen. I was in two of his workshops. Mm -hmm. uh, one was even a week long or 10 days, I don't remember. And I had a very strange feeling with him. He is um, abusive in speech to people. And then, uh, I felt it was an ego demonstration, so arrogant. I, I, I was, and yeah, anyway. But on the other hand, I think that's not right that people say a person cannot come because in the past he has said something and done something. For me, that's, that's not a good way of, of handling. You know, you must, uh, I mean, if there is a danger that a criminal comes in and does something, then I would say, okay, don't invite him. But but this is a, a person who is a person like everybody else and makes errors like everybody else. And only because his errors are more public, um, not to invite or to disinvite, which is very rude in my opinion. Mm. I don't I don't agree with this. If you don't want to hear him when he speaks, you don't go there. I mean, that's your choice. But mm. exclude the person because of something which he did maybe in the past or maybe not. Uh, and then I think it was in Charles Eisenstein, the book I just read, which is already 10 years old. Uh, and it's so, 
actual, I mean, very, very good. Um, I think he said, we are in times where we don't need gurus. We need uh, a different way of, right. and I always was in distant of gurus. Yeah, This was, uh, I also went to Genporoshi for a longer retreat, but always I was left with something. Uh, mm, mm, mm. I would never have been a, I know what you mean because I always say I have no guru gene, so I don't <laughs> respond to gurus. Uh, yeah. But Cohen was actually it was rather funny because he had a very Jewish mother, mm -hmm. who dominated him totally in New York. So you know what Jewish mothers are like in New York. <laughs> and he went to India and got enlightened within two weeks. Oh, okay. So and then she followed him. And so, and so on, and so, so it's really, actually, it's a funny story when you, when, yeah. you, when you look at it from a distance. But I always, the first time I looked at him, and it's always this first impression, he got this nice, uh, shiny vest, the small Chile, vest. Yeah. <laughs> a guru with a vest. <laughs> so, well. But he had a very big, uh, a very big uh, merit. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be here as I am now. He he uh, did this medicine uh, magazine. Uh, what is enlightenment? Oh, yeah, what is enlightenment? Uh, and and I uh, had many copies of them, and so I got to know the different uh, teachings, the different uh, mm -hmm. ways of spirituality which I didn't know when I, I came into spirituality after 40 and I didn't know anything about it. And so this, this uh, magazine gave me a good impression of what is, let's say, on the market, you know, and uh, I find that it's really, and it was really well done. Uh, I, I think, Monia, you know that. Well, I always translated uh, the talks with Wilbur and yeah. mm -hmm. Pandit at the Guru. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so absolutely. that is really a good thing he did. So for me, this would be also better to continue to, to invite him to, to integral uh, uh, um, events. So who knows why people are so strict and rigorous and unforgiving. How did you know about that he was disinvited? Um, Tom had some interactions i think with ben say regarding that and i know it was uh uh nomali Pereira who brought up her concerns and i think mostly it was that there had been no process to really nothing transparent about how the decision was to well, include him or not include him so just yeah. the process i think was that was the debate you know what it, also has a lot of stories with gaffney yeah and so she's was, really very, very sensitive about the topic. And yes, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, let's do with our spiritual teachers and continue our day. <laughs> Living oh. spirituality in our ways. <laughs> and yeah, thank you, girls, ladies. It was good to see you again. And we meet in two weeks. Okay. We in two weeks. Okay. okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Thank you Christine. Bye. Thank you. Bye. bye.